Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 7th, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming today, taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate it. I'm humbled by your presence. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait until we get to the charts. And then you can ask all you want. Actually, we don't have a lot to cover today. I'll explain that in just one second. So we should have plenty of time to get to all the charts. Also, I've done a poor job of promoting a show lately. So I see we have a smaller crowd than usual. Now, I started off this morning working on the micro versus the macro, which is something I've been working really hard on as of late with a lot of focus on the behavioral psychology, behavioral finance, and trading psychology. And I worked on that for about three or four hours early this morning, and then I realized that there was a lot more that I need to cover, and I was a little disorganized as far as, I know, even for me, <laughs> disorganized. And when I admit it, you know it's bad. So I have too much to cover, so I went ahead and shelved that, and we're going to revisit that next week. If you look at the latest column that I've written on my website, it's going to cover basically what... I want to cover next week, but in a lot more detail and off of a few more tangents. So this week, I want to come back to Trends Simplified and focus on where we are now, because now we're getting that first correction, and I think that it's important that we, and where we are. The name of the article is, Take These Simple Steps to Overcome Your Trading Temptations. So I want to get back to what we talked about last week, talk about trends, and I also want to talk about, more importantly, where we are in this cycle. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, just real quick, last week we talked about an uptrend being a series of higher highs and higher lows. And I know, duh. And... It's pretty easy to see, especially, of course, in hindsight. But when you boil it all down, that's it. It doesn't matter what 15th oscillators say or ADX or anything like that. By the way, I inadvertently put too much emphasis on ADX in my first book. I think I've said this time and time again, but the publisher wanted me to quantify some things for people who needed things to be more quantified, and I showed the ADX. And at the time, I did do some scans with ADX but I also still looked at all the charts anyway. So again, I think I put too much emphasis on the ADX, which can have long lead and lag times, like any other indicator. So a downtrend obviously is a series of lower lows and lower highs. And again, it can be quite obvious in hindsight. So what happens is when it gets a little confusing is when the market continues higher, it just kind of makes that marginal new high and then begins to sell off. Now, that looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? That's kind of where we are now with the addition of one more leg higher. At the least, if you didn't know anything, when we get to the live charts, I'll point this out. At the least, you could say, well, we've gone a little sideways. And that's often the forgotten trend. People always ask, is the market up? Or is it going down? Well, sometimes it just goes sideways. Now, this is from last week, and I'll show you an updated chart in just one second. So using the series of higher highs and higher lows, we now have a lower low and possibly a lower high in the work. So, yeah, a lot of this stuff is in hindsight. But as it begins to unfold, you begin to realize where you are. Now, we're not trying to determine a wave or anything like that. We're just trying to determine where is the market in terms of thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. Because once you identify that and a trend develops or if a trend continues to develop, then basically your job is just to get on board and ride it. I know. Easier said than done. Now, one other thing we've been talking about quite a bit was the 
10% system, the TFM 10% system. And just to, I'm not going to go through all the details. You can go in and watch prior presentations, but just so I don't bore everybody to death who's been here every week. But just to recap really, really quick, if the market gets more than 10% away from its 50-week high and there's daylight or Landry light, meaning that the high of the bar is below the 50-week moving average, and I think the signal is right on this day here, this week here, then you would exit the market, and for the more aggressive, you would look to go short. Now, that's a cool little system, but I always come back to something as simple as possible, and something just as simple, I should say, would be the 50-week moving average. If the 50-week moving average is a positive slope, and ideally there's Dave light, or Landry light as we now call it, where the lows are greater than the moving average, then you want to be mostly long that market. And then when you have downside, Dave Light or Landry Light, as we now call it, you want to be short or looking to get out of that market. Now, let's just hop into the live charts. And by the way, as I would say quite a bit, if you haven't already done so, Go to the members area, sign up for free if you don't see that banner ad on my website. If the banner ad is there, just put your information in and you'll get a free market timing course where I talk about a lot of these things in a lot more detail. Now, this week, rather than teach you all the market timing, which we spent a lot of time already doing, I prefer to just show you where we are in the current cycle and explain it from that standpoint. So... Let's go ahead and share. Let me share my screen here. So if we take a look at the S&P 500 and we look at the bow ties, as I've been saying quite a bit, we had a bow tie on the daily chart way back here. And the market had a pretty good sell-off, obviously, since then. And the same thing happened with the Russell 2000 and the NASDAQ. A little bit more pronounced in the Russell. And then let's take a look at the NASDAQ real quick. And then we'll come back to the chart. Same thing happened in NASDAQ too. Now what's interesting is, let's get back to the S&Ps. If we take a look at a weekly chart in the S&P 500, we see that we have a weekly bow tie here. Now this actually hasn't triggered yet. So... If we begin to make some lower lows in here, specifically we take out this low around 2,600 or so, and after this week, technically, I guess you could say if we took out this week's low, that would also be a trigger, a little bit more aggressive type of entry. But longer term, based on this indicated market, could be in trouble. Now, as I said, a nauseam, the last time this happened, it didn't turn into the mother of all downtrends. But in the Russell 2000, it actually lost about 18% of its value. But you can see that we had the bow tie signal here. We had a little throwback where it almost made brand new highs. Now, not that we follow this mechanically, but if you do have a bow tie off of all-time highs, then that all-time high becomes your reference point. If those all-time highs get taken out, then that bow tie is no longer working or no longer valid. And... As long as it doesn't, then the new potential downtrend remains intact. And you can see here, after the bow tie, we had a pretty serious sell-off. Now, this was enough to knock me out of every single one of my longs and also get me short a few stocks. And I didn't get rich off the shorting, as often happens. You often don't really get rich shorting. But I did make a little money in spite of the overall market. Now... I don't want to digress too far into the psychology of the market, but that's what we're doing by looking at the charts, right? The thing that happened in 2060, 2050 is it rewarded the buy and hold type of people thinking that you just hold on, hold on, hold on. Oops, I dodged a bullet. Now we're going to come back to that dodging a bullet in just one second. Also, this action in 2011, if you guys remember this, although... It was a weekly bow tie down. It wasn't off of all-time highs, but it still was a signal worth paying attention to nonetheless. And then if you just look at the net-net price move, we had a pretty serious slide back then. And let's just see what that was. 
So on a net net basis, let's see, the market lost about 16%. That's nothing to sneeze at, okay? And as I often preach, he who fights and runs away lives the fire to another day. The buy and hope people just held on through that, and they're feeling pretty smart. Now, we'll come back to those guys in just one second. Anyway, as I've said, a nausea, if you follow these major signals, they can and can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Can be in the keyword in that sense, I should say. Those are your major sells. Here's a major buy. Here's a major buy. Here's a major sell. And now, once again, we're in major sell mode. Now, again, on the bow tie, this one hasn't triggered yet. But I think we need to pay attention to what's happening. Now, we did also have, as I just showed you, we did have that 10% system trigger. And if we add in a 50-day moving average, hopefully the chart won't get too messy with that, you'll see that even though we're less than 10% away from that 50-week high, we don't have Landry light above that 50-week moving average just yet. So if we do... Remember, the system is two lows above the 50-week. And again, just go through the free market timing course. I felt like it was necessary to go ahead and give that away now because it's so timely. But if we get two lows like this in the market above the 50-week moving average, I wouldn't rush out and buy a whole bunch of stocks. But that would suggest that maybe things have improved enough to where we might want to either buy some stocks, think about getting long, or possible, this possible potential bear market is over with. We may have dodged a bullet. Now, speaking of may have dodged a bullet, let's get back to a, a weekly chart. I'm sorry, a daily chart. And remember, with technical analysis, we're just looking at the psychology of the market. We're looking to read the psychology of the market and I'm a big man on the street kind of guy and my phone never rings as long as the market goes up but when the market starts dropping especially when it does it precipitously I don't know if that's a word or not but in earnest my phone begins to light up so late last year and early this year, especially when everybody began to open their statements, I began to get quite a few phone calls from my friends and some relatives freaking out a little bit. They started putting a pen to the paper. Geez, I put in 4K into my IRA or whatever, 4K, 4K to my 401K, and I lost 12K in December. So they do the math. 4 plus 12 is what? 16. So, so in three months, they're down $16,000. They lost money. <laughs> uh, I'm not laughing. I'm just trying to do the math on how much they made working in those three months. And, and it just seems like the market now has made their whole life a bit of a scratch. Now, again, I'm not laughing. I'm just kind of laughing at the situation to where they begin to think, wait a minute. I worked hard, I made money, I lost all the money I made, and then some. So that's the thinking there. But then what happens, of course, the market begins to go straight up. One friend texted me. He goes, well, I exited everything. That was painful. And he did that somewhere down here. So he's probably cursing himself. And hopefully, I haven't been in touch with him, and I try not to get too involved with my friend's finances. But hopefully he didn't say, well, dang it, it's going right back up. Let me just jump right back in. Now, for those who did hold through it, which is 99% of most of these people, my wondering, my concern was, would people be thinking about getting out of break even at this overhead supply? And so far, we've cut through that like butter with the exception of today. Now, today is pretty ugly when you consider that this market is just going straight up for a long time. Percent change, no big deal, especially with this 10% change run. But 
It's what happens next. So my thinking is if this market continues to slide in earnest, everyone who thought we dodged a bullet, everyone who thought this sell-off was over is now beginning to rethink their positions. So I think that we could still be in trouble in here. Doesn't mean that I haven't bought stocks along the way. I take things on a setup by setup basis. And if I see something that looks pretty good, I'll go ahead and take it. And maybe we'll take a look at one or two of those positions if we get a chance. So I still think this market's in a lot of trouble. It's what happens next. We're definitely on an inflection point now. I was hoping, and I know, hoping one hand and the other and see which one gets filled first. But I was hoping we'd have the mother of all opening gap reversals to provide me with some opportunities on the short side here, especially in the the P's and maybe like a triple leverage crazy share or something, something like a TZA or something like that. But that didn't happen, at least not just yet. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ real quick. Same sort of action in the NASDAQ. We've had this big V-shape recovery right into this massive mound of overhead resistance. And it sure looks like that the market still is in a lot of trouble. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. And it's pretty obvious, at least to me, on a, a weekly chart. You could see we had the thrust down followed by the pullback. I don't know if you could see that in the... Um, let me draw that in for you. So obviously, all-time highs. Again, weekly chart here. And then pretty serious slide followed by a retrace higher. So thrust down, pullback. Now, what do we just talk about? We talked about thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. Okay? So right now, we're here. Now, like I said last week, if you're doing something like a zigzag or something, they're fun to play with, but just be careful. It's not like you know, you don't know this leg until the next leg completes. But as a trend follower, what you do is you take a chance and you say, well, we've got to thrust down. We've got to pull back. Is this new leg going to develop? So when you first get started in technical analysis, you see something like a zigzag, you're like, Oh, my God, I discovered the Holy Grail. This is going to be the greatest thing in Great Town. Well, settle down, Beavis. It doesn't always work that way. A little bit more complicated in real life. But if you identify on a net-net basis where the market was, where the market is, keep it simple. Use the occasional moving average. And then, again, pay attention to that net-net price change. And if the market drops 10% or more from its 50-week high, you really need to think about getting out of the way. I'm getting a few requests on longer-term market predictions. And it's something that I noodle with here and there. And eventually, I probably need to come up with something. And I hate to say it because I think that your real opportunity is going to be in your small cap stocks or your inefficient stocks and then occasionally shorting something like a big cap stock provided of course you have setups and all these but i've been wondering in more recent times if we could take some of this market timing and longer term timing and apply it to something like etfs even though they're more efficient but maybe create a little bit longer term time period and we get out the way when we have something like what we had in October and begin to see these signals trigger as they did in October, November, whenever it was. Just get out the way and then get back in when the market conditions improve. So it's in the back of my head. Maybe that's a someday type of project. I don't I was talking to one of you guys a few days ago. It's like I don't ever see myself walking away from the screen. But at some point I'm wondering if I'm a little less active and then I have a little bit more of that working longer term and I'm active when I need to be. But I, I, I doubt that I'll ever be able to walk away from a screen. And I don't mind being in front of a screen. And not that I want to be in front of a screen all day. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is at least 
checking in once or twice a day to see what's happening. I often even check in if I'm on an airplane. Um, anyway, so that's what's going on with the overall market. The sector action looks a lot like the overall market itself. A lot of these areas, pick your pick your areas, but a lot of them just have retraced back into the prior resistance, and now we're beginning to sell off. Now, I don't want to focus too much on the micro, but just chemicals because it's the first one that comes up in these major MIGs. You can see you had what? You had thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, and now you're getting a little bit of a thrust lower once again. And once again, what happened? It kind of stalled out at that overhead supply. It's not a perfect little line chart like we draw drew earlier, but it still looks like it's a market that could be in trouble. So let's take a look at just a few more of these real quick since we have time today and see where we are. Again, there's a same sort of reoccurring pattern. Take a look at the energies, kind of a thrust pullback into a little bit of resistance. And then now it looks like we could be in that new leg lower here. Right here, okay? That's today's action. Now, I want to be careful not to get too caught up in today's action. But bigger picture-wise, it sure looks like it could be the start of something bigger picture-wise. So as we go through these sectors, and I'll just go through a few of them that are interesting. Again, they look like the overall market itself. These sharp retraces followed by a little bit of sell-off today. Now, one of my big problems I've been talking about is like even if you went after an area like real estate, it's really hard. Like, yeah, it's going straight up in here, but it's really hard to expect this market to keep going higher. It made new highs. That's a good thing, right? Well, yeah, it is. But as I've been saying quite a bit, especially to my peeps in the service, it's kind of like running a marathon right after you just ran a marathon. Very hard thing to do, even for the best runner in the world. Now, as we go through these, you can see drugs are getting kind of whacked in here. So this could be the start of something much bigger. But as usual, what do we do? We take things one day at a time. And again, I'm not going to bore you and go through all these, but just want to show you where we are. And this is why I haven't gotten that excited about the overall market, at least just yet. Even the semis, which yesterday were beginning to push into this massive, massive, massive overhead supply, they're getting whacked pretty hard today, as you can see, down about 2%. Not the end of the world, though. I mean, if you just look at this leg and a little bit of this sell-off here, it just looks like a thrust and pullback, right? But I'm concerned longer term where all these sectors and indices are. I trade better when busy. Don't make up trades. Yeah, it's true. Reading Bob Bowman, Understanding Price Action. I've I've never heard of Bob, but I'm sure he's a new a nice guy if you're reading him, Howard. Okay, let me change back to a regular chart. Any questions on where we are now or where you think we might be now? And then We'll open it up. Uh, let's go ahead and open it up for for stock picks. All right. Any any stocks you guys want to look at? Any charts you want to look at? MPW long for Mr. Mike. Hey, Mike. All right. Let's do that. Mike says, "What's up? Good to hear your voice as always." Well, thank you, Mike. Oh, what's up? Got a webinar later today. That's and then. Like I said earlier, I didn't get all my slides done in time for today, so I'll have to do that again next week. Well, this is one of those REITs. We just talked about REITs. One of the problems with REITs is they've come a long ways, and sometimes when you're playing a relative strength game, especially in the market, that could be a little questionable. It can get a little dangerous in here. It could be the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Also, with REITs, as a general statement, they tend to be a little bit lower in volatility, not as excited about buying them. Well, you certainly can't argue with success. 
Now, with all of that said, notice that we just gotten past this prior little peak in here. So for me to get excited about a market, it has to clear that prior peak decisively. And then maybe I look to play the pullback. The problem is if it doesn't really clear that peak decisively, it could be a double top type of market. As I often say, with a double top and any other classical technical analysis for that matter, it rarely unfolds in a textbook manner. A lot of times with a double top, you'll have a couple things happen. You'll have the top. And then the next top is a little bit higher. And what happens is that kind of tricks everyone into thinking that, okay, right here, everything's fine. And then right here, maybe not, okay? And sometimes your double top will look like this. You'll have a pattern like a gatekeeper or something where it stalls short of that prior high. Well, right around here, kind of like where we are almost now, everybody thinks, well, I'm not going to sit around and wait for new highs. I might as well just get in here. And then when it begins to sell off, it begins to bum people out. So this one over here could, and could be the keyword in that sentence, this could be this variety here where you make that marginal new high. So in order to negate that, it's going to have to, Again, trade well above that prior high in earnest before I would get excited about it. Okay, any more? And I'll we'll take a look at what's happening in real time too. Now, a couple of you have asked about the VIX and have been talking about the VIX. Here's how I see the VIX. The VIX does not adhere to – I see people apply generic technical analysis to the VIX. The VIX is not a market that adheres to generic technical analysis. It's not a thrust pullback, thrust pullback. It's not a trending market. It is a reversion to the mean market because the VIX is measuring what? The VIX is measuring volatility. So if you are going to trade volatility, then you need to see the VIX in terms of reversion to the mean. But Dave, I thought you didn't like reversion to the mean. Well, I'm not a big reversion to the mean trader and don't I actually don't trade reversion to the mean, but something like the VIX has a reversion to the mean characteristic to it and could also help in your market timing. Now, I don't look at the VIX every day because the VIX only matters when it matters. But what I would recommend you do is plot moving averages on the VIX, and then I have a little system that I wrote many, many, many years ago when I was doing some research on Larry Connors, and I wrote my first book, and I submitted it to Larry. He published it in his little, uh, he had a little newsletter back then, Professional Traders Journal or something like that. But anyway, one, thing, one of the things I discovered, because Larry taught me about the reversion to the mean characteristic, is that when it gets stretched away from its moving average, and 10% seem to be a good number for that, you tend to have this pop back into the other direction. And on top of that, that becomes your sell signal for the overall market. On the flip side, when it gets stretched away, let's see which day this is, where it was really stretched. And you can see we spiked up in the VIX to where? To 35 and change, or 36. And we were well away from that moving average. That was on 12, 24, 18. Let's see where the market was on 12, 24, 18, Christmas Eve. Well, that turned out to be the exact low of the market. Okay. So the VIX only matters when it matters. If the market has just kind of grinded its way higher for a long, long time, as we did for years and years and years, then I wouldn't get too excited about the VIX. But if you see the VIX have a huge spike up, you know you're getting close to a low. If you see that VIX just dry up and get stretched away from the moving average, then you know that you could be getting close to a high, okay? So we have this CBR3 signal coming in here, coming in today, I should say. 
because the VIX was stretched away from its moving average. So that's how you play the VIX. Playing a volatility type of market can be really tough, but it can. It can be the key word in that sentence, help you. Notice this ridiculous spike we had back here, which a lot of people pointed out was actually worse than the more recent spike. But that spike ended on 2618. And then I'd be willing to bet if we go back to February of 2018, what happened then? Well, that was the 26. Yeah, see, you weren't even quite there. You were getting there, okay? So you know you're getting close to a panic type of bottom, but you don't want to rush out and necessarily buy stocks or anything. But it is a bit of a, a warning signal that, hey, maybe this slide is over. Now, it took a couple of days. Let's see, it bottomed on what, 229. Let's see what the VIX was then. Yeah, see, it still was, the VIX had already begun to revert back to its mean. So if you are going to trade the VIX, wait for it to get stretched in one direction and then look to go the opposite direction in the overall market. Or if you're trading the VIX in and of itself, you could trade it in more of a reversion to the mean type of manner. All right, any other questions? Any other stocks? I don't want to filibuster here. Let's take a look at gold. Gold looks pretty good. My problem with gold is, is it's got this big old mound of overhead supply to deal with. And that's why I haven't been that bullish on gold, even though it's going higher. And also you can see longer term, it's kind of all over the place. With gold, I prefer coming off of multi, multi-year lows like we had 2050, 2060. We got long some gold stocks back then. Now there's a few gold stocks that look okay, but a lot of them have just a tremendous amount of overhead supply. So I've been having a hard time going after those. Okay. Any other stock picks? All right. Question or thought? Let's see. The pullback of the S&P stops at the 50 day moving average or higher. What would you think? Well, the S&P, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the 50. Oh, was that a weekly VIX we were looking at? Maybe that's the problem. Let me just look at that real quick. Sorry. When was that spike day? No, it was a 2.6 still. Okay. Okay. Weekly S&P. And uh, let's edit that moving average. Okay, so the question is if the S&P stops at the pullback. Well, the S&P actually got through its 50-day moving average. And by the way, as Gary Kaulbaum once said, when you're between the 50 and 200, you're in this no man's land. And it seems like everybody's kind of jockeying for position there and kind of canceling each other out. It gets kind of choppy when the market's in between the 50 and the 200. So I'm assuming you're talking about a weekly chart. And if the pullback stops at the daily, well, it already, okay, if the pullback of the S&P stops at the 50 moving average or higher, what do you think? October high, December low, 50%, about 2650. Well, you're talking about a 50% or 50 MA, two different things here, because if you look at the, the 50 MA is right here, okay? And you can see that the S&P 500 just blew through that 50 like butter. And, yeah, it stopped at the 200-day moving average. Or if you want to look at a weekly, which is also the what? 50-week moving average. This is the 50-week moving average here, roughly. It's not quite, but you get the idea. And you can see it stopped there. So from the weekly standpoint, as long as we don't get much above this moving average, I would say the top remains in place. Now, if it gets the lows that get become greater than a moving average, then we would get a TFM 10% system, and it might be worth thinking about going long. So I don't know. I'm confused about the 50 in here. Now, the question is a 50% retracement. 
I'm not a huge fan of something like Fibonacci, but I'm willing to take a look at something like a 50% retracement. Let's see. I don't know if 50's in here, but whatever this number is here, we've retraced that amount. Now, keep in mind that I don't like Fibonacci, but Fibonacci a lot of times are, is going to coincide with something like a 50-day moving average or 50-week moving average in this case. So if that's a 618, I don't know where these lines are in Telechart. It's been so long since I've drawn them, and I've had two new computers or three new computers since last time I've drawn one probably. But, yeah, I hear you. So it's it's retraced probably more than 50% from those highs. And now we're at, again, an inflection point with all this. All right, any more individual stocks you want me to look at? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate your time, taking time to schedule. Sorry I haven't made the shows easy to figure out how to get in. I'm going to work on all these things as things begin to settle down. Of course, who am I kidding? They'll never settle down, so I need to just make an effort to make them easier to get to. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.